was a lecturer at Nevada University. And her found her to from Nevada. She's done extensive bibliographic work for Shakespeare postfolio, in, in particular for Shakespeare postfolio, is a descriptive catalog edited by Eric Rasmussen and uh, James. And Anthony West, that's right, in 2012. And now as the editor of the new very oral edition of Shakespeare's Bridge the Third. Um, her title today is Hidden Gems and Watermarks of the First Folio. I'm also going to introduce our next speakers um, so we can best um, you know time time ourselves for this kind of this uh, busy session. Um, Guillaume Coatelet is our second speaker from Université de Sergi. Um, Guillaume uh, holds an HDR. He, he's particularly interested in manuscripts and biography. He is, um, in particular, he's, he's edited two Elizabethan treatises on rhetoric, the foundation of rhetoric by Richard Reynolds, 1563, and brief discourse on rhetoric by William Medley, 1575, published in Brill in 2008. And he has co edited uh, with Carla Bajeta and Jonathan Gibson Elizabeth's foreign correspondence with Paul Ray Macmillan in 2014, and more recently with Carol Kirchhoff uh, Bertz and Thomas Wong translating Petrarch's poetry um, with the agenda Cambridge 2020. Um, he's actually he's, um, presently finishing a monograph on the figure of a poet. In English plays, of, um, in, in early modern English plays. So. And his title today is Reading the Reader's Marks, a uh, Reader's Marks in the Culture, Folio 68, which lines are four. Thank you. And our third speaker will be uh, Julian. Julian Nighthouse, who received his PhD from King's College, London, in 2022. Uh, he's, he's now uh, Lecturer on early modern literature at King's College. Uh, his article, Pseudonyms, Guilds, and a New Coriat Manuscript, was recently published in the Review of English Studies. Congratulations. And for the past year, he's been one of the print workshop fellows running the Bayard Press, a historical printing press located in the King's um, English Department. I think this is really important for his talk. And he's going to talk about print shop, print shop shifts in Romeo and Juliet perspectives from practice based research. Oh, so, Lara, I'm going to sit down basically handing the microphone to you. Oh, it's yours. Thank you. One of the things so far is going to be the videos and context and situating the issues for portfolio in the context of other portfolios. Um, so, I'm going to do a deep dive. Into the persona itself. Okay, this is better. Okay. Um, to repeat, I'm going to be doing a deep dive into the persona, um, specifically into the paper itself. Uh, so let us go. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, my um, uh, the project that I was involved with uh, began with Anthony West and his um, efforts to revise Sidney Lee's census of the first folios, uh, which had been done in the early 20th century, very early 20th century. Uh, later, uh, around the 90s or so, we, um, Anthony began. Uh, during the census of the first folios, and he verified Sidney Lee's findings, uh, and he actually revised Sidney Lee's census with a uh, movement around uh, sale, a movement of the um, of, of the folios that we had found. But in the search for a new census, uh, Sidney Lee uncovered about 80 more copies than had been previously unknown and unaccounted for in Lee's census. Um, and so his efforts led to uh, two volumes uh, published by the UOP. And one was, uh, volume one was the, just the account of the first folios and 
the sales. He was very interested in how a portfolio uh, was sold and how the price and uh, value of it uh, changed through the ages. Uh, and then volume two was his actual census. Um, his volume three was always, excuse me, <clears throat> was always meant to be a full bibliographic description of each of the folios. Uh, however, uh, he did not have the resources to continue that. So he turned to Eric Rasmussen, uh, and Eric Rasmussen has a reputation, he had and still has a reputation for uh, doing some impressive work uh, very quickly uh, and gathering teams uh, to get that work done. Uh, and so, uh, so he, um, uh, he, he uh, got me on board with the project uh, because he was involved with um, uh, finishing up with the guided works uh, of Shakespeare uh, for the Royal Shakespeare College. Uh, so, uh, so I pioneered this work and we kept it going for a while. Um, we, uh, the the research model uh, that I kind of came up with in conjunction with some of the early members of the team um, were to uh, to seek out any references or provenance that we that we knew about for each volume. So when we sat down with each folio, uh, we we were looking for any sort of outside information. Oops. There we go. Uh, we also then wanted to describe the binding, which seems to be an easy thing, but it really, really isn't. Uh, it's very, it took it turned out to be a uh, very demanding thing. We had to learn a lot about the um, we also We also recorded any damage uh, that, was, that, that was done to any, every page, uh, and then any, maybe any conservation efforts that had been done to restore the page, or uh, it's specifically when the damage involved loss of text. Uh, and we need to make sure we record that. Um, the other thing that we uh, recorded was the presence of press variants. Uh, that is to say, when uh, in the print process, a, um, an error was found on a sheet in the printing process, and the proofreader said stop, and then reset the type uh, on the galley, and then continue. And, uh, well, those early sheets, those uncorrected sheets, found their way into the actual collection of, of, the, uh, of the volumes. And that alone really means that every single folio is a unique artifact. Um, and so, it, so it's, it's very interesting. And um, I, I don't know, I'm really going to go into it in this talk, um, but the the sheer numbers of uncorrected sheets that we found in every single volume really, uh, really actually tells us a lot about the printing process. Uh, we would have actually expected to see far fewer uh, uncorrected sheets. We thought that that would be a rarity, uh, but it turned out not to be the case. So, uh, anyhow, going on, uh, and then we also collected uh, watermark data, and so that was quite the thing. Um, and and we uh, collected all of this in the descriptive catalog, uh, and so this is uh, sort of a um, sort of a fingerprint, I suppose, uh, for every single folio, uh, which sort of does a service uh, going forward, not only in our understanding and appreciation of each artifact, but also gives us uh, or gives certain uh, audiences uh, uh, evidence. Uh, to use if any of these uh, folios goes missing somehow and turns up later. Uh, <laughs> we can verify which is spooky. Uh, I, I suppose it would probably be So, so uh, in, in uh, the volume, uh, this is where we presume to take Um, Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure, but that's all it's been used for. Um, but, uh, but it does provide some important how to identification. Um, uh, what we found much more useful, and I will jump out of this for a second. Um, 
is when we actually took that data and took it across all of Thank you. Okay, so what you're looking at now, so what you looked at before was the watermark data for Glen Fall. This is the watermark data for all the volumes. These are all of the volumes listed across this row, and here are every single page. This is every single page. And these are the watermark identification for every single one across all of the volumes. So the way the, the, the way to read this is to say oops, is to say all right um a ten list um uh page A one when that was printed well A one was also the sheet that was printed was also was A one and A six right that's good and then the watermark that was found either on A one or A six uh, appears here. The colored cells are when we found anomalies, where we, we expected to see, uh, and I have a layout that makes this more clear. Um, we expected to see a watermark because the, the sheet would be out, the watermark would be on the side of the sheet, and the photo would then be placed in both ways. Correct. So uh, we, would, we would expect to see a watermark of some kind, either on A1. Or A6, but not both. A2 or A5, but not both. A3 and A4. That's the gap in this case. Okay. Uh, and so uh, if we if there were if there were any anomalies, we caught them and we had to try to explain them. Sometimes the anomalies pointed to an inserted sheet that was inserted to, to perfect a copy that had a missing sheet. Um, one of the things that surprised us in, uh, in this data collection was how many sheets were unmarked and had no running mark at all. And we'll get to maybe what, what that might mean in, in a little while. Um, but this is, um, I, I, I suppose if I was a better coder, uh, then I, I would actually put this uh, in a digital team and it is sort of, um, uh, Coded uh, program and the way of <laughs> Okay, so this is what I was talking about. Um, we have we have here uh, what a sheet would look like with the watermark somewhere. And the, this is this would be the following on the sixes. So one, six, two, three, and five. Yes, definitely. One and six, two and five, and three and four. Okay, so all of this, um, all of all of these uh, watermarks. Uh, participate in what turned out to be, by the time the folio was printed, uh, industry standards of paper. Uh, and, the, and industry standards would indicate the quality of paper and the size of the sheet. And depending on the need of the publisher, they would choose uh, whatever, whatever kind of paper made sense to them according to the project and the budget. Uh, and so you get, uh, you get something like fool's cap, uh, which was used quite often. Um, and then you get uh, our crown paper that was used for the crown. Well, William Prim, who was a, um, a Puritan um, a school, uh, we'll say, um, he was not pleased whatsoever uh, that something like, uh, that something like uh, uh, play texts would be printed using crown paper. Uh, he actually uh, complained in his, uh, his, his sort of analysis uh, that Shakespeare's play 
Shaker stories are printed on the best brown paper far better than some files. I mean, I, I, it, it is sort of me from what I'm thinking of, 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 of taking Seinfeld episodes and, and, and printing them with gilded pages and, and all of this. Um, okay. But let's look at this crown paper. Uh, if you, I've blown this watermark up quite a lot, and hopefully you can see uh, that you've got you've got your very nice watermark that's the photograph I've taken, uh, and then uh, and then because there's not so much text involved with this particular sheet, you can see the chain lines. Uh, now, uh, a reference color. Uh, uh, we can get the full term. Um, for a while, uh, I mean, Carter Haley uh, said that uh, he, he, he advocated uh, for the fact that you cannot actually positively identify a single watermark unless you've counted all, you've measured it to the millimeter uh, every, uh, from, from top to bottom uh, using, using the chain, chain lines as a guide. Uh, he also said, in addition uh, to, to, to measuring from chain line to chain line, uh, top to bottom, uh, that you also need to count each one of the spaces between the chain lines to make sure that you accurately identify every single watermark uh, as a specific instance. Uh, and what he called this uh, practice was the mugshot and fingerprint. Where, whereby you say, okay, I can identify this as a specific type of crown um, watermark, and then uh, I'm going to specifically identify it given the chain lines and all of that. Um, and this is a this is a perfectly valid uh, method of identifying watermarks. Um, but I, I I would like to uh, remind you of our project. Um, Uncorrected, un uncorrected sheets describing the bindings, collecting the data on the watermarks. Um, what we found as we went along, as we were looking through uh, and, and turning 900 pages uh, of a folio every single day, uh, was that we saw thousands of we saw thousands of watermarks. Uh, we identified thousands of watermarks, uh, and we were able to identify watermarks, um, for, you know, uh, at, at 20 bases, basically, as it, as it went on. Uh, and so identifying each and every one of these using the chain marks uh, seems to be a bit of a bother, uh, mostly because uh, what, we, what, we started, what we began to understand was that these watermarks became distorted through the milling process. And so that means that this particular shape uh, well, I mean, even this particular instance of this watermark, it's not perfect. It's been, it's been um, crunched up a little uh, on this side. Uh, so it's already, you already see some distortion happening. And if the distortion uh, takes the watermark to the point where it no longer conforms to the measurements of the chain lines, then, then what do you have? Do you say it's a whole different watermark or not? Uh, so the so uh, so the much of the fingerprint is is awesome, uh, but I don't know that it was particularly useful for us. Um, we identified twenty one crowns, twenty one watermarks uh, for use throughout the folio, even in the distorted shapes. And yes, twenty one crowns. Uh, and some of them ended up having a nice little, um, a nice little, um, a, a, a little pet name for them as we were We, one, one thing that, uh, one thing that I, um, one thing that we just, we, we expected, or we did, we didn't know uh, as we were collecting all this data. But one thing, one happy acronym was that, um, 
we actually found uh, patterns in the data. And that's that's what you hope to find. Uh, but you don't know that going into it. We just we, we were just collecting data. Uh, one of the patterns that I found was that there was a specific sort of shape and size to some of the crowns. Uh, and so I grouped these, I, I sort of thought, let's not thought of them as, as um, watermark families. Uh, and this one was a round button pressed with some ornaments, not that you can see. Um, and then there's some, some of them had ciphers, uh, IG, LC, and so on. Um, and these comprised 83% or so of, of, of the data watermarks. Uh, the next grouping that I found uh, was just this one here, uh, the ETP one, uh, and it, it, it was very, it was uh, only 2% to 2.3% of the watermarks, uh, but it does, it is distinctly different than the crown that I had in the much bigger as you can tell. It's, it, it is, it is much, it is much flatter, uh, it has, the ornaments are much more Uh, this one here is much, much smaller. I'm not sure that you can tell that uh, in scale. Um, it's much, much smaller. We knew things this one from off end. Whenever we saw this one, we said that was the uh, But it's almost 100% of the uh, of the one so it's, it's uh, round. Uh, then we have the flat crown, uh, again, that is very different than the other ones. So I can move them together. Six percent, uh, and it's often distorted. Um, this round crown, um, yeah, this one, this one was uh, an interesting one to play, uh, but it only uh, constituted almost two percent of the watermarks. And then the simple crown, uh, again, it was hardly even identifiable as a crown, really. Uh, but uh, we call this one flat foot. Um, and, uh, and and that was three and a half percent of the watermarks. Uh, so when you boil it all down, uh, there's uh, there are six different distinct watermark groupings, which um, I guess as a conclusion um, means that there were six different uh, suppliers. Of paper for the first folio, seven if you consider the unmarked paper that they used. And it's hard to know why they used that unmarked paper. Maybe they were running out of paper that day and ran down the street to another printer and asked for some. I have no idea. Um, there, were, there were no distinct differences in either the thickness, stiffness, or color of the unmarked paper. So it's very hard to know if they just came from the mills that way. Um, for whatever reason, maybe the watermark fell off. Um, it's hard to know. Um, in conclusion, I guess I just will say I'm going to come up to my time. Uh, but the um, as far as descriptive bibliography goes, I I think um, you know at anything that I've ever read about uh, bibliography, and it, it's been quite a lot. Uh, it always turns out to be sort of a show and tell. Um, it's a show and tell with, with perhaps uh, conclusions that are mostly suppositions. Uh, we, we don't have a way back machine. We can't sit in the print shop and actually see the practices. Um, but, uh, but it is uh, quite an interesting snapshot into uh, what, what we might have done uh, using forensic. Uh, evidence and uh, and methodologies. So, thank you.
Okay, so thank you very much, and thanks for a fine conference. So uh, my original title was Reading the Regents Hearts and Ponder Folio 68, which lines work for, and then yesterday I came up with another title, or a study in frustration. Uh, because I'm a man coming from manuscripts, and I usually deal with extracts written in manuscript. And the problem here was identifying them, which turned uh, out to be quite difficult. So in other words, I've got a who done it, but I don't know who the murderer is. I don't even know if there's one murderer, several murderers. And secondly, I don't even know when the crime was committed. So I've got plenty of questions and no answers. Afraid. So I'd like to reflect on what it means to read the folio at any given moment in history. And I guess the conference is very much about this. So I apologize if we repeat just common ideas, but as you all know, it's about reading the collectibles. It's also about reading them in the original and not in another version. And it's about reading a text with no notes at all. Uh, so you've got an immediate um, you've got an immediate access to the text uh, without any learner notes. And the history of reading is very much the history of extracting, and a lot of wonderful work has been done uh, on this topic. And I'd like to uh, thank uh, the author, Shakespeare's early readers, not least those many other, because uh, when I came across this particular copy on the archive, Dot org, my favorite uh, internet site, I guess. <laughs> um, I came across these marks and I was all excited about them. And then I thought, but this must have been done just a thousand times. So I had to check with uh, Jean Christophe Mellier and he said, no, you go for it. Because even though I did write about it, this puppy, there's still a lot to be done. So that was very kind of him to send me his notes. And I've also been working with. Uh, this um, database of dramatic extracts, which uh, we're probably familiar with, uh, but it covers only the 17th century, which is already a lot. So these are dramatic extracts in manuscript, but you've got nothing about the 18th century. So if you want to know who copied what from Shakespeare, uh, you go there and you check. And, and so it was very useful for the particular extracts that I've got in this copy. And I found out that the choices were not entirely conventional, that most of these, of these choices did not occur in this database. So that was very useful. Uh, so that's what you've got. Uh, you've got uh, first owners. Uh, name and too late saves the early models. So I wasn't too happy about this because the date was 1838. So I was thinking, but what about before that? And do we know when uh, or where he found the book, acquired it? So if you go on the Felder's uh, website, this is what you get. And now I don't know what to think because possibly he's the one who marked the copy. Uh, because in the 19th century, people liked clean copies. Now, we all hate clean copies because we find them boring and we want to find all sorts of marks and better still writings, uh, well, words and manuscript in copies. That, that's just marvelous. But as, as you all know, uh, collectors in the 19th century, they, they wanted clean copies. Uh, so, one hypothesis here is that. He acquired a clean copy and he's the one who marked the extracts. So he would just be a 19th century reader. So what you find out at the end is an intriguing suggestion. Uh, others may suggest ways in which the text could be shortened. And I disagree with this because nothing seems to indicate that the reader is trying to shorten the text. <coughs> 
So who is a reader? Is there only one? Well, I don't know. The folio bears no name, let a moon a date. We're left with marks, ink, and extracts. And as a brilliant Claire Ball notes in Marking Shakespeare, interpreting sparse and fragmentary notes can prove frustrating and often impossible. So that was a good start. <laughs> So here I go with my reading marks. Danger, anything may become one, but because you get obsessed with all these marks, because at first I hadn't noticed these tiny marks, okay, these lines, and it's only thanks to uh, Jean Christophe Mayer that because he had made, made a note about them, so I returned to the cover and I started seeing all these marks. And uh, what you see here is a great variety of things. So sometimes it's fairly straightforward because when you've got a great, a long line and you've got these brackets, you know where it stops and you know where it begins. But uh, very often, or not that often, but sometimes you get crosses, for instance. So crosses signal the beginning, but even the beginning is ambiguous because if the cross is not really well placed, you don't even know what the first line is. And second, you don't know where this is going to stop. So my hypothesis here is whether a cross is marked or an entire speech, which is one possibility. But when you've got an entire speech, it could very well stop before that. So I've got a tiny note here on Bill Sherman and Hannah August, uh, who have done wonderful work in, uh, marks, but they tend to concentrate on spectacular marks. So what I've got here is uh, a collection of humble marks. Well, only some invisible ones. And, and when I went back to the copy, I started uh, just considering spots. And every time I came across a spot, I was thinking, well, is this spot a mark? And I decided most of the time that they weren't. And I've got quite a few riddles as well. So I don't know whether this needs to teach. It, it seems, it sounds like the last thing here, but I, I, I don't even know. So I started thinking and dreaming about a child uh, learning this Latin. And, I, and, and it also looks like a 17th century hand, but that could be someone else. And then there's this, which I used in the very beginning which is right beneath Shakespeare's portrait. And I've seen something like this before, but I don't know where, and mm. which is really frustrating. And it sounds like a cipher, I think. It does sound like a cipher. So there's somebody playing a joke. Okay, so here we go for the choices. Um, so, that is fairly useful, but I guess this is better. Okay, the reader's choices, or reader in the singular or in the plural. So you've got three comedies, uh, a certain number of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight histories, and the rest, tragedies. And so he seems to prefer tragedies. He doesn't seem to be very much interested in comedies. Okay, and uh, the other point, uh, the other suggestion is that he seems to be very much interested in antiquity and Shakespeare's representation of antiquity, or Shakespeare seems to be a valuable author because he writes about antiquity. And there's only one extract from Othello, and I was thinking, wow. That's a good play. Why didn't he just pick, pick other extracts? And only two from Hamlet, which isn't a bad play either. And the most martyr being Julius Caesar. Okay, so antiquity seems to be his theme and mythology. So he's, he's a serious reader. So one other question was, of course, did he, she, or they read the entire folio? Well, presumably, but I'm not sure at all. And Unmarked doesn't mean unread, as Emma Smith makes right, and she's often right. <laughs> so I, I don't know whether a person read the entire folio and 
um, just discarded some phase or whether it could hit um, some phase before. So perhaps this is what she, uh, he, she, or they found relevant in the phase that he, she, or they read. Now, these extracts vary considerably in length from a couple of lines to entire speeches and even exchanges involving several characters. And length does matter. And the number of fairly long extracts points to an 18th century reader because in my experience, 17th century extracts tend to be shorter, probably because they're easier to use in your own writings and commonplace things more fragmentary than the 17th century. Uh, so this is an example of the, um, a manuscript from 1705. So I've just said that they tend to be shorter, but I've got a counterexample here. Well, not always. Here's a nice chunk of text. So that's around 1705. So around 1705, we do find long extracts of Shakespeare in manuscript. So what did the reader want to do with the material? Well, it's difficult to know with any certainty. Perhaps he copied them, perhaps not. If he did copy them, what for? And did he use them for his own purposes? Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> because, well, what uh, historians of, reader, of reading tell you is that um, the use of extracts change. Uh, that, in fact, Shakespeare became a model for the greatest uh, writing and the greatest verse, but he was not necessarily used in someone's own writings. Now, thematically, a few topics emerge, the usual suspects, say love, women. There's a lot about women, so you're always thinking, well, this must be a man, he's this quite a lot of misogynistic stuff as well, so he's somebody who's got problems with women. Uh, mm -hmm. Death, fortune, bravery, and justice. He's got praise and blank verse, but no songs at all. And I found that fascinating in itself because I know that songs were very popular, and uh, notably in the restoration, they were all crazy about songs, and they, they really liked the songs. So that also may point to a later week. Conceits, but also rhetoric and speech insights and Romans country men. So my idea is that this is somebody steeped in rhetoric or with great admiration for classical rhetoric. And uh, this corroborates the, the interest uh, for antiquity. A lot of preferable material, the devil himself will not eat a woman. On the hill, shining passages, purple patches, and material found in printed commonplace books with headings. So that was interesting because, uh, as you all know, printed uh, extracts uh, were very popular in the, in the period, uh, in the 17th century and even and later on. So for instance, there's this, the 1655, Don Cockgrave's selection, and um, in it you find a few passages which were uh, singled out or marked by my reader. Uh, so one of the interesting points here is whether he had read these passages before in one of these printed collections or not. Uh, but this proves that these uh, extracts were already popular. And then there's this later a uh, very famous collection as well by William Dodd, The Beauties of Shakespeare. And you find some, uh, you also find some extracts in this, uh, which are marked in the copy. So my hypothesis uh, is that he marks them, probably not to use them again, uh, but as a personal Best of Shakespeare anthology. Uh, so I'd like to go back to um, dating, because when it comes to dating, uh, well, I've got the testimony of ink. So this sort of thing, or here. Uh, yes, so that's quite dirty. Um, and just the type of brackets as well. 
So there's something that I haven't done, and that's to compare with brackets in the 19th century. Okay, that's that thing. Uh, because I'm not very familiar with how people read in the 19th century. And that's probably something that I should have done and should do now, uh, because that might be confusing or not. And of course, the other uh, way to date uh, the, the marks is to consider the extracts themselves. And due to the length of some, because this is a very lengthy passage, uh, this is not common in the 17th century. That's something that I know. Uh, so this points to the 18th century and perhaps later. Okay, so this is where I'll stand at the moment. But very, thank you very much for your attention. So I've also slightly altered my title from uh, what it was. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I've also slightly uh, altered my title here. Um, now it's a rationale for introspectives from print, uh, printing practices research. Uh, Romeo and Juliet is still in it, so I'm still in Shakespeare. Um, uh, and so first, though, I wanted to say how excited I am to be here, and thank you to the organizers and society for generously uh, including me uh, in the celebration. Um, well, I think of it as a celebration for school, right? Okay? So, um, and what I'm talking about today is also kind of different from what I usually work on. I usually focus on like socio literary things and Thomas Porter. Um, but today, uh, instead, I'm thinking about practice as research and practice based research, um, though not how it's usually meant. Uh, when we hear practice based research, especially relating to Shakespeare, we think of stage performance, of productions of Shakespeare's play that bring researchers and practitioners together to produce something that can be studied as a dramatic object and as a textual object. <laughs> However, I think we can shift our perspective of uh, what practice-based research entails in order to learn more about Shakespeare's works as they exist in printed textual forms. And so to be clear, what I'm talking about here is printing as a form of practices research. And so I'll start by discussing the rationale of this approach, including some scholarship I found to be helpful uh, in conceptualizing it. And then I'll share a small test case with you, which I can't overstate its insufficiency, uh, but it is, it is actually, I think, helpful in kind of getting me going. Uh, and then I'll conclude about what some of the benefits of this approach uh, might be. So to begin with, and it's useful to kind of take stock of what theatrical practice as research is, although I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir. Um, uh, so Stephen Purcell in 2017 in the Shakespeare Bulletin article did a really great job of just distilling um, uh, what it is, calling it any scholarly work in which performance practice constitutes a major part of research inquiry. He also makes the point that this type of research, quote, privileges the subjective, the embodied, the collaborative, and the provisional. Uh, and he quotes Estelle Barrett's comment that uh, practice as research is a demonstration of the fact that knowledge can be derived from doing and from the senses. So uh, practice as research uh, can, it's useful because it can uncover or perhaps recover some aspect of Shakespeare's works that is inaccessible by through the text alone. And uh, there's something you can get at beyond the text. And there are interesting, I see interesting similarities here, uh, especially after the previous uh, um, Lars group, 
um, thinking about the project of the new bibliographers and kind of trying to get at something that wasn't in the text. Um, the idea of envisioning ideal copies of Shakespeare, uh, versions that don't exist, and versions that never exist. There's not any of these ideal copies, but they're still editing trying to get them. And that's not that that's what practice as research practitioners in theater do, um, but there's uh, they're still uh, kind of aiming at um, getting in touch with the Shakespeare play as it can exist or as it could exist. Uh, and so the practical focus, oh well, yeah, they allow. Um, so sorry, scholars are able to do this by allowing themselves to experience what it's like to participate in the labor used to make a play. So practical focus on non authorial labor can be really illuminating for thinking about Shakespeare dramatically because it changes how we hold the concept of play making in our mind. And I think that the same holds true for textual studies. If there's value in experiencing uh, deeply knowing the non authorial dramatic work that goes into a play, then the study of the first folio as a textual printed object or we could benefit from an uh, analogous treatment an experiential study of the type of work that went into producing it. And I've said it a few times, but I want to continue to come back to this word work, which also do see sort of kind of hit on today, the idea of work. Um, it's, you know, it's because conceiving of Shakespeare's plays as works gives us freedom around how to think of them. Work can equally indicate a manuscript, a printed text, or a stage production. And uh, in each of these cases, there are different agents putting in the work to create the work. So we can conceive of works not only as the product of the genius of an author, but as collections of labor contributed by several people. And I've just added a quick note here since yesterday, um, because of so many wonderful talks at this conference that focused on the role of commerce and production and survival and attribution and reception of Shakespearean texts. We can add into that idea the other side of things, that these texts are works that embody sort of the dead labor of anyone involved in their production. So kind of the other side of producing the commodity. Um, so in her uh, a chapter called Where is Hamlet? Text, Performance, and Adaptation, Margaret Jane Kidney uses the riddle, if the Mona Lisa is in the Louvre, then where is Hamlet? To uh, ask ontological questions about Shakespeare's work. And as the rest of her chapter title, uh, suggests she can be explores whether a Shakespearean work is located in the text, so which text, uh, or performance, again, which performance, or an adaptation, uh, which asks, you know, how far can we get away from Shakespeare while it's still where Shakespeare is located? And so the question is complicated, and each of these answers can be correct in their own way. But the variety of correct answers seems to indicate Shakespeare is all of these things, and his works exist as cultural objects. One's own relationship to Shakespeare is how one conceives of them. And that is why experience is important to scholarship. An actor has a different relationship to Shakespeare than an audience member or a researcher. And likewise, printers have a different relationship to Shakespeare than readers of his work. The experience of printing brings new relationships into the critical and interpretive field by widening the researcher's culturally constructed idea of Shakespeare. So, that's just kind of a quick version of my rationale. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to kind of articulate that. Um, I want to now share with you a small test case to demonstrate how experience printing can change the way that one reads and critically interprets printed text. So I, I, I'm a letterpress printer, as well as a early modern study here. Uh, and I, I started letterpress printing in 2015 while taking classes and writing a master's thesis with uh, Joshua Eckhart at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, the first text to be printed, really we reprinted it, we attempted to make a print called um, was William Simmons's 1609 sermon preached for the benefit of the Virginia Company of London, which I've got a picture of it locked up in form, and also um, one of the image of our, of one of our productions. Uh, we followed up the critical editing project where we uh, made manuscript facsimiles of three manuscript versions of Dunn's Holy Sonnets. Um, and then we use those to reprint our own critical edition of the Holy Sonnets out of that. Um, I don't have pictures of that, so uh, I followed that uh, with printing portion of Paradise Lost, that's the book one. Uh, not all of it, and, but we did use the uh, facsimile of the printer's copy that still exists in Morgan Library. And um, Megan Kern, uh, who is currently working at Ethel Oxford, was also really involved in this. Um, so just wanted to mention her here. Uh, and then after a bit of a hiatus and getting a 
PhD. Um, I, I uh, made a, I was made a print workshop fellow at King's College London. They bought a press and then um, they needed people who knew how to work the press and I did. So I was able to kind of start interacting uh, using the press um, at King's and I've been using it in my, my teaching and teaching MA students and undergrads by kind of bringing them to the print shop. Um, I'm working on a grant right now, uh, hopefully it'll work out where I'll be able to use the press at King's to print a bunch of um, 16, mid 16th, uh, sorry, mid 17th century cavalier poetry, especially the really funny playful ones where they rhyme the word road with a picture of a toad and things like that. <laughs> right? It's really, um, really fun. So you may notice a distinct lack of Shakespeare in my printing experience. Uh, I intended to print selections of Romeo and Juliet prior to the conference, but um, industrial action in England and also me getting COVID at the beginning of March uh, kind of made that not able to happen. Um, and uh, but hopefully in future versions of this, I can bring some of that to the table. Um, however, I've still found my experience of printing and reprinting other modern texts have uh, enriched my engagement with early printed versions of Romeo and Juliet. So for a small example of how bringing a printed, uh, printing focused practices research approach uh, can be helpful, we can look at the prior speech around what modern editors call either 2-2 two, two or 2-3 two, um, in, uh, in, in Romeo and Juliet. This is the part where the prior talks about the concoction that Juliet will use to simulate death. Um, he says, within the infant rind of this small flower, poison hath residence and medicine power. For this being smelt with that part, cheers each part be tasted, slays all senses with the heart. Uh, it's this last phrase quoted here, slays all senses with the heart, and specifically the word slays I want to talk about, um, precisely because the word slays is not consistently used. Uh, the spelling isn't consistent, but also just the word isn't exactly always the same. And again, most of you probably know this. But, um, uh, the word appears as stays in Q2, uh, where stays is, no, I'll just stay here, sorry. Uh, the word appears as stays in Q2, while all the other uh, early editions contain some variant of the word uh, as slaves. Even in Q2, where stays is drawn from, it's actually uh, kind of difficult to tell whether the word stays or slaves, kind of glance at it. It's difficult in reading, uh, the difficulty in reading the type stems from the material. The early modern period, of course, the type was made from soft metal with a melting point, often including a lot of lead. Um, and as the type is used, it's worn down. Not only does this worn down type give a poor imprint, but it also becomes less distinguishable from similar looking or feeling letters. So the ST ligature, um, you can see it sort of in the middle left or yeah, up there, um, uh, used in stays, uh, it's been severely worn down. Excuse me. The ligature's thin connection at the top of the two letters is so worn that it can no longer be an impression. Interestingly, you can see um, that other long S's and ST ligatures in the vicinity have managed to keep their tops. Uh, so the failure of this ligature in stays to leave a mark doesn't seem to be an issue with inking or crust pressure. And all the other tops of the S's made it. Um, so why did this variant occur, right? There is a possibility of the printer of Q2 is working from copy that had the word stays in it, but there's not a way of knowing this. Um, so it makes sense, at least for me, to look for a material reason for this variation. And uh, approaching a problem equipped with experiential knowledge gave, um, gave through, gained excuse me, through printing as research practice, uh, I was able to find one. If indeed the crossbar of the T, if the crossbar of the T, like the top of it, was worn down um, as it appears to have been, although you can still see it a bit. Uh, there's a good chance that the, the distributor putting the type away put it in the wrong compartment of the case, and the compositor didn't register the error when they set the type. Um, my experience printing has taught me that after you learn the lay of the case, like kind of how you can do touch typing, you don't have to look, you can just know where you, what keys you're given. Um, you can do that similarly when you're setting type and just kind of know the, you know where the letters are, and you can grab them and quickly put them in the, um, in the compositing stick. Um, and you do this, well, at least I've experienced doing this by making sure the feel is right of the letter. Uh, it, maybe not, I mean, usually I try to look at it and double check and make sure that I'm putting the right letter in so I don't have to edit it out later or, you know, fix it, stop cross corrections. Uh, but sometimes I don't, and you can kind of just quickly, yeah, I don't always 
do that. And so it could happen that the both the distributor and the compositor mistook this by feeling and just kind of suck it in. And then someone else proofreading later maybe didn't have a copy to, to be reading off of. It stays the heart. The heart the heart doesn't move in a bad way, right? So it um, uh, stays the heart, slays the heart, could be kind of equivalent. Um, I, I feel like that's, uh, you know, that, that, that's possibly what happens. Uh, and, and that's why I said it's not, it's not a huge monumental revelation, but it is, um, well, it may seem like a small point, I guess. Uh, and I admit it's very speculative, but my point is that the knowledge uh, I applied to this interpretation of the text, I only had uh, because of my experience. And um, does that experience provide a perfect understanding of early modern printing practices? Definitely not. I used anachronistic tools. I have a 19th century hand press that I use, and I did it far from an original pr uh, printing environment. Um, uh, I worked in a, at a pace that was different uh, than early modern printers, and my intentions were different than early modern printers. Um, so I'm not saying that this is original practice. I'm not saying I emulated or simulated well, what they did. Um, however, uh, you know, I think much the same can say about uh, much the same can be said about theatrical practice-based research. Sometimes you can, people really go out of their way to the original practices and it's admirable. But other times it's, you know, you're involved in a production of Shakespeare and you get something from it, even if it's not exactly how it would have been done in the, in the 16th or 17th century. Um, so I want to end now just by sharing that the reaction to printing that I see most often from students um, is that they think it's really cool. When I bring students in, they're really excited to be doing it. But they're also sort of in awe at how fiddly and time consuming and laborious printing is. Um, they, they get a lot more, uh, they, they leave with an impression of a printed book that's like, wow, I can't believe, can't believe someone actually did this, which also is sort of my first impression after printing just a small, like a quarto of 50 pages. And then I look at the first folio and it's just, I can't imagine a person would do that to themselves. Um, but, uh, but obviously, the whole different circumstances. Um, and while some, well, you can definitely argue that a lot of the research potential um, uh, of, of this experiential knowledge could be replaced by deep bibliographical study, um, the descriptive bibliographical study, and some creative thinking, maybe. I don't think that the impact on students experiencing printing can really be overstated. Um, it also is a way to kind of get into descriptive bibliography that isn't so much charts and, and things. It's, I've been reminded of um, anyone who's been to Rare Book School at, 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 um, at, in Charlottesville has taken the descriptive bibliography class. We have a little, I guess it's a poem, it's a rhyme. I'd rather be beaten for hours and hours and read 30 pages of Presence and Bowers. <laughs> um, it's just like, it's descriptive bibliography is so impenetrable sometimes, but it's, uh, this makes it a lot more, I mean, there's suddenly students have a reason to want to know why, you know, why is form, why do you talk about format or um, you know, why is it important to know about the lay of the case or to think about how compositing um, works? Even from uh, setting a single line of type or inking and pulling just a couple copies from the press allows students to learn a lot about bibliography in a way that is tangible and enjoyable in small doses. You don't, I mean, you know. um, but uh, that experience then extends how they see books like the first folio up here. Uh, this is a Folger copy, by the way. I don't think I put Folger on the slide. Um, which is, I think, you know, it, so this experience of exciting, um, getting to actually think about how books are made, uh, lends students uh, excitement when they look at these books, and I think that's a pretty good way of celebrating the 400th birthday of this book. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And so I'm honest to tell something actually reality. Yeah. I'm sure there'll be lots of comments and questions. Um, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. It's all really fascinating stuff. And what to get on there? Um, I have a question for Guillaume. It's uh, so enjoyable hearing you kind of talk through the problems and the impenetrability of these marks. Um, and I briefly mentioned to you before your paper that 
thought so that looking at the Milton copy that we're all now relatively familiar with, again, you've got those lots of lines, what to make of them. But, uh, my question is, so you, you, your um, sort of, your theory, your working theory for this, is this is a, one particular individual's kind of greatest hits. Uh, uh, yes. yes. Yeah. And, yes. and it's my sense, I think, with histories of reading that we have a kind of innate bias to read the mark as favourable. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> and, and, and I'm just wondering about that and, and whether or not in your mind is the possibility that a mark can um, not be favourable, but can also, there's a kind of hostility sometimes. And those marks, which are really something just, all, I guess all we can really say is a kind of, it's the distribution of attention or something, the traces of attention. But that attention doesn't necessarily always seem to me to have to be benevolent. Yes, but the, the larger issue is whether each mark has got its particular use and its particular meaning. And that's something that I don't know because perhaps he just chose them uh, well. Perhaps in some cases they don't make any difference at all, but sometimes they seem to make a difference. Uh, so the two things, there's of course what it may mean as to uh, the value of the extract, and the other point is where the lines begin and where they stop. Um, so that's just um, uh, picking a particular part, uh, but you've got something else in mind, which is false value, and just aesthetics and whether the reader likes the passages or not. Um, well, I think I thought that he liked them because, because of rhetoric, in fact. And uh, the reason partly that I asked the question is in your characterization of his habit there, it's, your, one of your uh, descriptors was purple, it's purple, uh, which is a sort of pejorative term. Oh, right, it's, purple, purple patches. It's a purple patches suggests a sort of florid abundance that's actually maybe unnecessary or provoking irritable kind of sense. Uh, of well, he's he um, chose in particular passages in which there's a lot of parallelism and sometimes very heavy going parallelism. And he seemed to like this, I think. <laughs> but, but, but perhaps you're right. Perhaps it could be negative criticism. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Comparing with the Saint um, folio, for example, um, it, it, it was easy, well, easy enough to identify some passages that were marked, that were marked for boys uh, to play. I mean, it was specifically for um, the school schools and school use. And uh, very probably the, 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 the kids were given some parts and uh, quite uh, clearly all female roles were uh, marked out and only the, the, the the male uh, roles remained, you see, so that was quite interesting. So I thought maybe in what you had observed, could we see anything that could have been meant for school practice or uh, use? No, I don't think so. You don't, you don't. No, I don't think so because you've got, well, you've got female speakers as well, female parts. And, and the other thing is that is uh, the idea that these are speeches which stand alone that you could read independently uh, so they've got a moral purpose or a larger purpose i don't think the reader was interested in performance in theatrical performance at all i think to him these were just a uh, verse and uh verse with moral value and because it's quite very obvious well yeah. Listen. it's quite obvious in the in the saint omer that it was for school practice. Mm -hmm. Yes, just to follow up on Higgins's um, remark, um, um, I was going to ask about the same question because precisely the brackets and the crosses 
are also used by sensors. For example, heard the telegraph cranes marking of so the traffic of Sir John van Lott and Banfen. And so when the marble speeches, but we know that but nothing is a critical reason. Uh, but there's no sometimes there's no commentary. Um, so we don't know exactly sometimes it's written literally what is wrong, but sometimes it's just across opposite line. And I had um, uh, another question uh, for, for all of you now out of England. Do we know how much cost the making of the product? <laughs> because we know that paper was very expensive. Paper, um, paper was well over half of the production cost, uh, which is which is sort of which is sort of surprising considering that we had to pay compositors and pressmen and all of this. Uh, but the paper was far away um, between half and two thirds of the cost. Of I don't have the numbers right in front of me as to actually how much it costs to produce one, um, but uh, it was quite it was quite enormous. I just thank you so much. I just wanted to ask Julian. Uh, uh, I loved your, you know, your comparison between. I mean, basically, John Dewey's you know notion that you learn only through experience and from the use of the senses uh, is 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 very good. And what I want to know, okay, that's one of the really uh, two stupid questions. Oh, yes. Were you saying that basically there's an an ST ligature ligature and an SL? That's the first thing I want to know. Yes. And where do they and how how is the box um, is the case set up? Yes. Yeah. And uh, how do you feel it when you're pulling it out? That's what I want to know. Right. I um are sorry. they next to each other? They are next What's the organization? Yeah, I, I almost included a picture of Moxon's label case, and I did it because I was like, I don't know, jam stuff, it's just pictures and stuff. Um so so you have um gosh, yeah, it's basically you have a tray, and there's a bunch of little compartments in the tray, and there's no lid. It's just open. Uh, I should have put a picture in this because it's going to be weird to explain. Of all of the pieces of type, right? And, and of the whole alphabet. Um, and in fact, um, in the early modern period, there would be two, two cases. There would be the capital ones would be at the top, and the lowercase ones would be at the, all the, the uh, minuscule would be at the bottom. That's where we get uppercase and lowercase from. The, the capital ones are the uppercase. Um, and then uh, mixed in with it. it's not set up alphabetically it's set up in frequency of use um so there's some, like uh, or at least modern ones are and i'm pretty sure in the early modern period it was also it wasn't alphabetical it's still frequency of use so t h e are like right here so you use t h e all the time a and r, a and r next to each other i and s are next to each other um some of them are not anyway ligatures sort of are in a different section, and you've got the SL and the ST and the SS and that the FF and whatever other SSL, I think is another one. Um, and you know, you put them back in that area. Um, and so that's sort of one localized area, though. So it's not like you would be putting them um, in, in different spaces. And you feel them, you're standing up when you're going down. Yeah, 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 yes. You're kind of so standing, it's usually not really so you, you're you're picking what you know where in the same way that I know where the, the you know maybe the M key or something here is on a keyboard and I can tap it without looking. You, you kind of know where the, the pieces are and you kind of grab it, which I'm now realizing is bad practice. <laughs> maybe that's not what's going on, but it's a possibility. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I would also be really interested if anyone thinks this is either a good or terrible idea, and you can tell me about it later. But kind of bringing printing into uh, research. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. And you asked me if I had something for the conference, and I said, Can you give me a printing press? Because we can um, maybe use that, but maybe you can come to the things if I can. Yeah. 
Cipher, also called the Freemason cipher from ah, the beginning of the 18th century. Okay, so, so what does we mean in this instance? Uh, so it's um, the alphabet, there's no substitution of letters. It's actually two, um, uh, four, um, it's easier. Okay, <laughs> can you decipher this particular? Yes, I think so. So what does it say? Uh, well, it depends. It's uh, the first one is a bit uh, weird. It's either a P. The second one is J, definitely. The third one is a, is an F. The fourth one, I think, is a G, and the last one is an A, perhaps. Um, it's uh, it's like if you if you search it on Google, you can find it easily through the Freemason site. So, so what does it mean? Does it make sense? Uh, I so uh, I identified it by the second character, which has a point, uh, okay. a dot, uh, with the, and this is typical of the first letter in the second uh, second croix. Um, I would like to go back to um, Julian, what you were saying that was absolutely fascinating. I actually find that the, the reading, the Q2 reading of slaves instead of slaves is much better. Yeah, yeah. And it reminded me of, um, it's very famous in France, the line by Malherbe, who is exactly contemporary with this period. Um, he wrote in the Comics, he wrote two poems, and the second is a rewriting of the first. And it's very famous because there's this legend that he wrote um, for, in memory of a young girl who had just died called Rosette, mm -hmm. but that the print, he did not cross his T's and the printer misread Rosette and it became and it was Elle a vécu ce que vit les roses, l'espace d'un matin, which is one of the most famous lines in French poetry. But actually, it, the legend is that it, it should have been a Rosette a vécu. Instead of and, and the rose she lived, it should have been a rosette she lived. And um, that reminded me of that that you know, printing mistakes that actually end up making or maybe not printing mistakes, maybe he that's how he wrote it because it was not that bad of a poet after all. Um, but it's very interesting how you highlighted how easy it was to you know make a mistake, and that's um. I think if Shirley was implying that maybe it has been misplaced, you know, by an earlier user, 
and that, as you as you were saying, it was so um, you know damaged that right. it was easy to to mix the two up, especially if we were working fast or anything. Yeah. So thank you in, in a word. Thank you for bringing us back to those material conditions which determine um, four hundred years of, of scholarship yes. um, yeah. over a text. Um, we are incredibly dependent yeah. on those early agents in the production uh, of the book. For sure. That was fascinating. Yeah, I, asked, I did it. I tapped, again, didn't put this slide in, but I've done a survey of just eight kind of editions printed this century, um, copy and modern editions, um, one of which I think the 2012 Arden Renee Weiss edition as well. Uh, about half of them use the 2 2 variant, which doesn't really come up very much in other early. The you know, portals or folio. Um, uh, I mean, it's not the first you know, several, um, but I just think that's so interesting because it kind of it, it is an off, a, a potential mistake, uh, when, you know, or maybe not a mistake, but some non authorial thing. Or maybe it's a little, I don't know. I, you know, I don't really know. Anything, <laughs> but um, it, it, it opens up a whole different interpretive sort of direction. I also teach paleography somewhat. At, at, well, Kings with uh, wherever, and I use quills, and I have them learning sec English secretary hand. And the reason that I got interested in paleography is because I kind of realized I could, if I mistake if I mistake a, a letter for another letter, and it makes semantic sense, and it's poetic sense, and it's rhetorical sense, or whatever, then maybe that's what it is now. Uh, which is kind of me again saying, I'll just make a mistake, and now that's forever. You know, who else is going to retranscribe this thing? Um, which I, I guess I shouldn't be admitting on the. Matter or whatever, but um, <laughs> I, I, I don't purposely do this, but I do think it's such an interesting that it offers um, mistakes and slippages and things like that offer such an interesting sort of way into um, uh, thinking about texts and, and editorial texts. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just a real quick question? Uh, for, for Laura. Uh, so I was just curious about, um, so in my process of looking at this, I was looking through Hanlon's correlation of the, of the, and I was just wondering how that factors into the work that, you, that you're doing, or if it does, or if you can kind of, if you move away from it or anything from the cloud. It was put together a big correlation of the first folio, and it's hard, I can't read this basically, but maybe. Sure, he identified about um, 500 or so. Press variants. And as we uh, were preparing uh, our research tools, um, we decided to uh, choose 330 of those uh, that were actually substantive uh, variants that were just like keeping issues or, or stray uh, problems. Yeah. So we, uh, we, we looked at uh, punctuation, spelling, things that would actually be substantive, and then we traced those as well. Uninformed, but I mean, would, would it be to 
in theory, would it be possible to use this information to actually date, um, I mean, to actually see how the photo was printed, right? How many teams of printers, yes, and in what order, which which you know bundle was printed first? Right. Human gives us a human gives us a um, a sequence of printing. And using that sequence and using the data that we have, we can say, okay, in this month they were printing this play, and this is the stock that they were Do we know who the providers were? You said they were French, but who they know more about than they were I that's probably the next line of inquiry, but uh, they were definitely this newspaper, this crown paper definitely came from France. Uh, at the time, uh, English um the English paper mills uh, were not, they did not have uh, access to the same uh, materials. Uh, they didn't have access to linen. Uh, the French paper um, uh, uh, brokers had cornered the market in linen fibers. And the only thing that the, uh, the English had were wool, their woolen fiber, uh, and the paper that they were able to make from, uh, from that material was only good for wrapping things. Uh, so that so they wanted to, it wasn't up to the quality of printing. Uh, and crown paper was not the best paper they could have chosen, but the best paper they could afford uh, with this for this project. If it was the best paper at the time would have come from uh, uh, the Netherlands. Thanks. I, I, I also want to just to uh, ask Laura something, and I, I want to just quickly commend for the amount of labour that's, that's gone into that. And, and also, you, you very modestly, towards the end of your talk, in a kind of very self-aware way, suggested that lots of enumerative and descriptive bibliography can appear as a kind of show and tell almost. And but another way to think about that sentence, that offering, that way of thinking is that it's incredibly generous, that work, in that you're slightly resisting um, the sorts of payoffs that disciplinary forces might uh, solicit from you, might try, try to get you to do with it. You know, you've created a kind of incredibly generous data set or something like that through absolutely heroic <laughs> archival turning of pages and looking and note-taking and data records and you know, totally to be commended, I think, and really, really brilliant work. And so I, and I guess my question on that is, um, pure bibliography like that, I think often finds itself in this pinch. Lots of people want to do things with it, you know? Maybe I was very struck by the fact that you've noticed, okay, we can now say maybe that there are six papers, maybe seven. We can start to think about the number of paper suppliers who are, Sending him to Jagged or some middleman merchant. It's interesting. It's a kind of new line. Of, and I, my question is, but you, but you also mentioned, okay, but there are also potentially legal uses of if a spolio gets stolen, it becomes a, a reference point. It's a different frame of meaning. And my question is, do you have a sense of that book's been out for a few years now, survey? Do you have a sense of how that work has traveled and how your kind of very careful and sort of pure account of those watermarks, how that is kind of walking around in people's usages and where it's going and what we're doing with it. Do you have any sense of that? Thank you. Maybe you don't. <laughs> okay. um, I can uh, I can say that uh, Eric's been approached. Um, on several occasions um, by scholars who want to do something with the data uh, and has asked him if there was uh, if, if there were spreadsheets available uh, that, that could be made public um, that actually uh, made those lines of what we printed uh, use of the data uh, without having to have somebody a poor grad student probably uh, just type it all in. Um, and uh, to be honest, that was one of my, um, that, 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 that lit a fire 
under me to actually finish my dissertation. So <laughs> that's my data. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I, I don't know how to exactly how to answer it beyond uh, we we actually use it as a reference all the time um, as uh, and as uh, and scholars are asking questions about um, provenance and uh, uh, data uh, in photos and this is something else to be collected. Um, and, and and we're constantly going back into it. Uh, and uh, I, I actually can see some revision work done uh, as folders move around. So, yeah. That's too loud. Um, sorry. Um, my question was it wasn't possible at all to have forged uh, watermarks. Or any interest in having it in this cycle? This, uh, I mean, with so many forgery around, I mean, why not forged? Because they are so irregular in there. You, you make an excellent point. The, the, <laughs> so, uh, in the effort to uh, perfect uh, uh, photos that had missing pages or, da or, or pages that were damaged, uh, the, to the point where uh, a binder would want to uh, get a, a, a more perfect page uh, to replace a damaged page. Um, there were several uh, forgeries. Uh, uh, Frank Harris is uh, famous for, uh, he actually went blind, uh, actually meticulously creating folio pages. Uh, and he signs them uh, very small. Uh, and and he used crown paper, so um, I don't know if there were like extra uh, crown paper laying around or, or where he found these, but he saw a lot of marks from those forgeries. And were like, wow, what, what lengths they went to 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 perfect a photo. Uh, but it also meant we had to be the team had to be very well educated on um, on second quality of pages, which we saw last night. Um, well, we saw it second. Uh, we had to be we had to be well versed in how to uh, spot those because oftentimes a second photo would be cannibalized to uh, to perfect a first photo and it was uh, in the refining process. Okay, well, thank you very much. And that was absolutely fascinating. And uh, please let's um, make a round of applause. <laughs>